On this Sunday night, after historic flooding devastates parts of the B.C. interior, officials are warning it's not over yet. Residents are being told to stay away as they brace for a second surge of water. So what's causing this unusually bad flood season? Also tonight, a series of deadly suicide attacks in Indonesia. The bombers, a mom, dad and their four kids. And later... Harry versus the media. Why the prince is shutting the chapel door on the British media ahead of that big royal wedding. This is The National. Normally, warm spring weather is something to celebrate, but in parts of B.C.'s southern interior, it has unleashed destructive floods, the worst in 70 years. Across the province, about 4,000 people have been forced from their homes, particularly hard hit, the towns of Grand Forks and Osoyoos. Tonight, waters are receding, but officials point out that snow is still melting in the mountains at a dangerously fast rate, which will once again overwhelm three major rivers. The swollen West Kettle River flows south, where it links up with the larger Kettle River, itself much higher and faster than normal. The Kettle River then swings east to meet the Granby River at Grand Forks, a location that makes the town vulnerable and the situation still very serious. Briar Stewart is there. Three days after the water rushed into this neighborhood, more than 100 homes still sit submerged. A handful of residents stranded after not heeding the calls to leave earlier. We've swept the area. We've uh, just been notified today that there's three more people still in their home. Which is why there were more rescues today after 30 over the weekend. Oh, man. At times, firefighters had to swim through the water, <sighs> polluted with toxic chemicals and sewage. Yeah, I definitely get inside. It's a nightmare when you look at that. It's just, I can't imagine it, like being in there for days and not leaving it just it's unimaginable while other neighborhoods are drying up more than 2500 residents in the grand forks area are still out of their homes and are urged to stay away the destructive path of all that water is obvious even some of the dikes have been eaten away two days ago this is how downtown grand forks looked today some of the initial cleanup has begun the water levels were you can see the lines. Those who work in this office are relocating to higher ground. And this flood's done in a lot of these old buildings that I don't think they're going to be able to be used again. Personally, that's what my feelings are. This building is starting to move as we're getting our last of our things out of here. Even at those businesses that were lucky enough to stay mostly dry, it's all hands on deck today. As people work to build those walls of sandbags even higher. We're just uh, trying to keep it, keep it, keep it dry so we can open up eventually. But uh, who knows? This might, uh, this might ruin us and a lot of other people. I think so. Because it's likely not all over. Flood forecasters expect there to be a second surge of water this week. Rivers could swell even higher than before, which is why crews are working to repair the dikes that were damaged in the first go round. So when you hear that it could be higher. What's your thought? Well, we'll do our best. And try to prepare for all that water heading this way again. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Grand Forks, BC. Now, some spring flooding is normal in the region, but not like this. So we asked Environment Canada's senior climatologist, Dave Phillips, why it's just been so bad this year. We went from almost um, winter to summer. I mean, spring was like three minutes long, and, and that's a, a bad situation. You have all of this um, uh, snow in the, in, the, in the mountains. We saw in some places the, uh, in the Fraser uh, River, the snowfall, uh, snowpack in the mountains. And uh, what we saw was, yes, a, a cool February, March, and April. And then the last week of April and the first two weeks of May uh, has been very warm. Temperatures at at least five degrees warmer than normal, and in some places uh, to up to about eight or 10 degrees warmer than normal. So what you've got is all that snow melting quickly, a very rapid snow melt, which has engorged the rivers and creeks and lakes, just too much water to handle. And in this past week, 
we had some fairly hefty amounts of rain in the valleys. And it may get worse before it gets better because what we see this week, we're going to see temperatures that are going to rocket up there in some places to 30 degrees, 12 degrees warmer than, uh, than normal, and lots of sunshine, long days. So the, what's going to happen is in that mountains, in the middle levels and the higher levels, you're going to have that snow melting around the clock. So not good. The last time southern BC saw flooding like this, though, was seven decades ago. During a period of rapid population growth and economic development, the scale of the disaster at that time was unprecedented. This is the monstrous child of the quiet snows, flexing its terrible muscles in the gorges and canyons. A new and terrible kind of desert suddenly appears, a desert of water. Community after community wavered and fell before the onslaught of the river. Every 24 hours brought fresh reports of disaster. So that language might seem a little over the top by today's standards, but he was not exaggerating the facts. Over 22,000 hectares were flooded, an area twice the size of Vancouver. It forced 16,000 people from their homes. It cut two transcontinental rail lines and swamped the Trans-Canada Highway. Adjusted for inflation, the total cost of that damage was well over $200 million. On the other side of the country, floodwaters continue to recede in New Brunswick, allowing people to return home and assess the damage now. Officials say most areas could be below flood stage as early as tomorrow, and roads are reopening across the province, including in hard-hit areas like St. John and Majorville, where people are starting to get to go back. For some, life is getting back to normal, too. Fredericton held its annual marathon today, though they did have to alter the traditional route. Cleanup there is expected to cost tens of millions of dollars. Here's a quick look at what else is coming up on The National. What we know about the young family behind a series of suicide attacks in Indonesia. Plus, we begin special coverage ahead of next weekend's royal wedding tonight. What Meghan means for the monarchy. Adrian sits down with royal biographer Andrew Morton. But first, it's a controversial move in a contested city. The U.S. is about to relocate its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Palestinians are outraged, but today the Israeli government rolled out the welcome mat for Donald Trump's delegation. Led by Ivanka Trump and her husband, Jared Kushner, they attended a party hosted by Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. The official opening is tomorrow, but today thousands of Israeli revelers hit the streets. Derek Stoffel was in the thick of it. This is the day that Jewish Israelis come out to show their pride for this ancient city. They filled the streets, young and old, loudly proclaiming that Jerusalem is their home. Hilly Adler from Toronto is studying here. Jews have a core and have a history in Jerusalem, and that this isn't a 70-year-long history. This has been our Jewish home and the center of Judaism for thousands of years. Jerusalem Day commemorates the reunification of this city when the Israelis won the Six-Day War 51 years ago. The event this year is bigger than usual as it comes as Israelis are celebrating the 70th anniversary of their country. That's not the only reason much of Israel looks like one giant party right now. They danced in the streets into the early hours of the morning, celebrating the Israeli singer Netta. Her song, Toy, won the Eurovision Song Contest last night. Even Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu got into the spirit with his own take on Netta's signature chicken dance. But for many Jewish Israelis, the biggest reason to celebrate will happen tomorrow when the United States formally recognizes Jerusalem as Israel's capital and moves its embassy here. Something Israel's Prime Minister tonight said other nations should do as well. I call on all countries to join the U.S. in moving their embassies to Jerusalem. Move your embassies to Jerusalem because it's the right thing to do. But Palestinians will not be celebrating, far from it. They're still angry, accusing the Americans of being dishonest brokers, siding with Israel. And they're planning major demonstrations this week with Palestinians from all walks of life showing up. For me and for my people, I think we have to resist all the time. 
Israel has beefed up security measures in Jerusalem and beyond. The police and army have sent in reinforcements as the protests over the next few days could quickly turn violent. Derek Stoffel, CBC News, Jerusalem. This embassy move seems timed for maximum political impact, happening against the backdrop of, well, depending on what side you're on, a day of celebration or despair. But in practical terms, less changes tomorrow than you actually might think. We are almost ready to open the beautiful new embassy in Jerusalem, Israel. We're so excited. Actually, that new embassy they're opening is the site of an existing U.S. consular compound that wasn't designed to house a full embassy. It does include this lovely former hotel, now home to elderly immigrants. There's no space yet for the U.S. ambassador to live, and he won't even work there full time. He'll spend a lot of his time in Tel Aviv at the old, functional, far less controversial U.S. embassy building there. Of course, as far as the ambassador is concerned, tomorrow, none of that matters. This year, thanks to the courage, the vision of President Donald Trump, we can say, L'shana hazot Yerushalayim, this year in Jerusalem. But the hunt does continue for a permanent Jerusalem embassy, which is expected to take years to build. The next challenge for the president in shaping his foreign policy, that summit with the elusive Kim Jong-un. Scheduled for June 12th, the outcome of that summit is already starting to take shape, including total denuclearization. What does the North Korean leader want in return? Today, senior members of the Trump administration started talking about their expectations. And Paul Hunter takes us through it all. He's been the subject of mockery and derision, yet Kim Jong-un, with his fearsome weaponry, has already won something, a sit-down with Donald Trump to talk nukes. The key question now, is Kim actually serious? We are not to the place yet where we should be remotely close to declaring that we've achieved what it is we want. There's a great deal of work that remains. Our eyes are wide open with respect to the risks. Uh, but it is, it is our fervent hope that Chairman Kim wants to make a strategic change. The denuclearization. That change, as Korea Trump has put it countless times, is a complete denuclearization of North Korea. In other words, Kim has to agree to abandon one of the defining aspects of his regime and country. North Korean state TV has not only long boasted about the country's nuclear capabilities, it's also trashed the U.S. president as an irrational, senile spewer of nonsense. Coupled with Trump's counter-insults, it's hardly the stuff of trust and goodwill. So what's up? The U.S. believes Trump's random threats have worked. If the past is any indication of the future, you got to watch North Korea like a hawk. But I do believe they're at the table because they see a different person in Donald Trump. And they believe if he had to, Trump would use military force. The U.S. also believes hardened sanctions have hurt North Korea. Today, emphasizing uh, Trump sea could sea offer to lift them. I think what uh, the prospect of, uh, for North Korea is to become a normal nation. Uh, to behave and interact with the rest of the world uh, the way South Korea does. But that's only if North Korea agrees to denuclearize. Meanwhile, Donald Trump's preparations ahead of the summit are said to be very intense. This is new stuff for both sides. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. So what's it like to meet with Kim Jong-un? Mike Pompeo was in North Korea last week and in the room for about 90 minutes with the North Korean leader. Uh, what struck me about him, he is very knowledgeable in the sense of he knows the files. Um, he's very capable of engaging in complex set of discussions. When I ask him a, a question about something that's a little off, he answers it. There's no note cards. Up until that meeting, former NBA player Dennis Rodman was the most high-profile American to have spoken to the leader. So things are evolving. To Indonesia now, where police say the suicide bombers who attacked three churches today were in fact all members of one family. Moments after a suicide attack on an Indonesian church, children and women lay among the dead and injured. The perpetrators, some just children themselves, a father, mother and their four kids. They struck three churches in a series of coordinated attacks 15 minutes apart in Indonesia's second largest city of Surabaya. 
The mother and her daughters, aged 9 and 12, all had bombs strapped to them at one church. The father detonated a car bomb at a second church while his teenage sons carried bombs on their laps as they rode a motorbike into the third. At least 13 people, including the attackers, were killed, more than 40 wounded. This terrorism act is barbaric and beyond the limit of humanity, President Joko Widodo says. Police say the family were among 500 ISIS sympathizers who had returned from Syria. The father was the local head of an ISIS-inspired group. Indonesia has seen a recent surge of violence just before the Islamic holy month of Ramadan. Still ahead on The National Tonight, it's a difficult Mother's Day for the hockey moms of the Humboldt Broncos. We'll show you an international campaign to try and lift their spirits. Plus, what can a company get away with by putting a disclaimer in the fine print? Go Public investigates. And Prince Harry, he's all smiles here, but in tonight's dispatch, you'll see why he's not always quite so happy in front of the cameras. I'd mentioned that he's losing his hair. He walks across, you know, 10 yards, 12 yards away, comes up and just bang, puts it right on top of my head, the, uh, the purple paint. Yeah, and I mean, I'm laughing there, but I wasn't feeling too happy. On the National Tonight, Quebec NDP MP Christine Moore is denying allegations of inappropriate behaviour. Retired Corporal Glenn Kirkland said that in 2013, Moore made unwanted advances, including following him to his hotel, sending explicit messages and showing up at his home. Moore told the Canadian press today the misconduct allegation is, quote, a total lie aimed at attacking her credibility. She says she was, in fact, in a romantic relationship with Kirkland that lasted about four months. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh has ordered an investigation. We're watching the campaign trail in Ontario, where talk of a coalition is already swirling. I can't tell you what the uh, what the end result of the election is going to be. All I know is that we're on day five, and we're going to keep working as hard as we can in every riding across this province. I think it's important to give people a chance to make their decision. Uh, so we're going to wait till June 7th uh, before we make any decisions that uh, uh, that we might have to deal with. When asked, because they were asked about this, both the Liberal and NDP leaders say it's just too early to talk about the possibility of joining forces. If the progressive Conservatives win a minority in next month's election, our CBC poll tracker models show that the PCs under Doug Ford continue to lead in the polls. Now to a go public investigation. Ever find you don't always get what you pay for? Thousands of Canadians complain every year after discovering what's advertised isn't what's delivered. Tonight, Rosa Marcatelli has the story of one couple who went shopping for a new car and wound up frustrated by the fine print. Here, Canada just pretty much said, you know, tough luck. Eric Kim blames a small loophole for marring a big purchase. He and his wife, Yandi Lam, paid thousands for upgrades on their new Kia SUV based on what was advertised in the company's marketing brochure. When it was delivered without one of those options, the higher-end taillights they paid for, the company pointed to the fine print that says it can change almost anything it wants at any time. It's not even the value of the taillights, it's more we feel ripped off. I feel like these car dealerships and these car companies just can just get away with whatever they want. Thousands of Canadians file complaints every year about companies that advertise one thing, deliver another and then point to that fine print as an explanation. Advertising Standards Canada has a long list of companies that have been reprimanded for doing just that. Everything from flights to cars to fast food. This is what yes. the customers were given. Mm -hmm. and we have, what, seven, eight pages, yep. all the features yep. of the vehicle. And then mm -hmm. at the very, very end is this disclaimer we're talking about. We showed that Kia advertising brochure to a marketing expert. When they say fine print, they mean fine, fine print. Fine print, yes. Like I even, I was trying to read the details of it, and it is. Yeah. Okay, it could use some magnifying glass. Having a disclaimer is not a way to uh, just do away with your ethical, legal, uh, moral obligations to customer satisfaction. It goes against it.
Kia Canada stands by its disclaimer, telling us that the company's brochures clearly state that all information contained was accurate and correct at the time of printing, and that Kia Canada reserves the right to make changes at any time without notice and without obligations, adding customers should visit kia.ca and confirm with their dealer before buying. That could be problematic. That is risky business, according to Daphne Hooper, who specializes in competition law. She says the couple could have a case under the Consumer Protection Act. A consumer in Canada is entitled to look at an ad and based on the information that is being conveyed in that advertisement to purchase a product. We asked Kia Canada about a possible legal issue with its fine print. The company didn't address that in its response. The couple has some resolution. After Go Public contacted the Kia dealership, it issued a $1,000 refund, the cost of the upgrade the couple paid for but didn't get. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. Go Public gets its stories from you and the tips you send in. So if you've got a tip you want the Go Public team to look at, you can email them at gopublic.com. Go public, rather, at cbc.ca. If you spent the day with your mom, you have this woman to thank, Anna Jarvis. In 1906, grief-stricken over the death of her own mother, she campaigned to have a day dedicated to her mom. You still have time to call yours. And as one historian told us, Jarvis would have some advice on how we should celebrate Mother's Day today. When Anna was a girl, she often heard her mother talk about a day. There needs to be a day. Somebody needs to establish a day to honor mothers for everything they do. It was supposed to be a simple day of homecoming, of gratitude, not just buying your mother things and thinking that's enough. So the most common fight she had was with commercial industries, the floor industry, the greeting card industry, um, the candy industry, right? It's the heartfelt message, the handwritten note, not the greeting card. It's a spending day with your mother, not just sending her a gift, not just sending her chocolate. For most of us, getting parents' approval for marriage would be a quick conversation if you have one at all, but a royal has to get one of these. The script, the signature, the seal, behold the queen's consent for Prince Harry and Meghan Markle to get married. Know ye that we have consented. Can't get more warm and loving than that. In all seriousness, no, the royals are just like everyone else, except that they are some of the most closely watched people in the world. Whether you're born into it like Harry or marry into it like Meghan, you can expect the glare of lights and click of cameras wherever you go. Kicking off our week of royal wedding coverage, we look at that media spotlight, one that Harry has been working to avoid. Here's Thomas Degla with our dispatch from London. Prince Harry's story has been one told through pictures right from the start. But he'll be known, say his parents, as Harry. The lens captured a star since birth, sometimes a wild child. Prince Harry is apologizing tonight because of a picture that's causing jaws to drop in Britain. The shot is... Always an unwilling celebrity, still struggling as an adult to define boundaries as his wedding day approaches. Arthur Edwards has photographed every chapter of that story. Harry always was the favorite of the, of the readers, certainly the readers of our paper. And so their, their coverage of them is huge. As the Sun tabloid's royal photographer for 41 years, his camera has acted as a window into Harry's world. At weddings and on vacations. From boyhood to manhood. Harry in New Zealand, and uh, I'd mentioned that he's losing his hair. He walks across, you know, 10 yards, 12 yards away. Comes up and just bang, puts it right on top of my head. The, uh, the purple paint, yeah, and I mean, I'm laughing there, but I wasn't feeling too happy. Edwards and other journalists describe Harry as genuine and kind in private, though his attitude seems to have hardened since Meghan came into the picture. Yeah, it's been a little bit difficult recently. As a reflection of that difficult relationship, while 600 guests have been invited inside St. George's Chapel, only one reporter and two still photographers will be allowed in. 
Compare that to the 28 reporters and 17 photographers inside Westminster Abbey for William and Kate's big day. William allowed the press in. Harry is basically shutting the door. Hiding behind the excuse that this is a private wedding is pretty nonsensical as far as I'm concerned. With Harry bent on protecting his new love interest in the fall of 2016, he took an extraordinary step. Prince Harry has issued a rare statement condemning the way the media have treated his new girlfriend. He's been dating American It read, his girlfriend, Meghan Markle, has been subject to a wave of abuse and harassment. The message to the media was clear, back off. Likely dictated by Harry himself, the bold words struck even former tabloid reporter, now Harry's unofficial biographer, Duncan Larcombe. The Prince Harry that I know doesn't like the press. Um, and whilst I've got on quite well with him, I've always been a burglar, but I've been a burglar with the courtesy to wipe my feet on the way in, effectively. That's how I see our relationship. Maybe that has something to do with this. Harry's bitter memories of the paparazzi snapping these pictures of his mother, Diana, anywhere she went. Their constant presence illustrated here, a Diana besieged by photographers on every side, the moment captured by Max Chizotti in his paparazzi days. Where this red Prius is, is where Diana's BMW was facing that way, because there was a photographer there, I was there, there was another one here, there was another one there, and there was one walking past to get a different shot. For photographers, there seemed to be no rules. That is, until the night everything changed. Diana, Princess of Wales, is being remembered around the world. Harry's mother, killed in that infamous car crash in Paris as her driver fled the paparazzi, the moment that would forever taint Harry's view of the media. Those people that, that caused the accident, instead of helping with taking photographs of, of her dying on the back seat. And then those photographs made, made their way back to, uh, to news desks. He went on to have his own embarrassing run-ins with the press. This is the photo of the prince in what appears to be a Nazi uniform. It was taken at a costume party. But now more than ever, regular photo opportunities are carefully stage managed by the palace PR machine a chance to snap pics of little George and Charlotte when their brother was born, or Harry and Meghan the day they announced their engagement, all attracting huge throngs of media, a palace strategy to drive down the price of candid shots on the street. Nowadays, it's, uh, it's not uncommon to receive uh, a letter from solicitors when you uh, photograph uh, the young members of the roles um, in, in a public place. There is no press freedom. Oh, there, there is, but uh, a lot less than there was. Even this age-old institution has turned to social media, sharing exclusive pictures of the children, word of the engagement, controlling the flow of royal news, but not all of it. Camilla Tomini at the Sunday Express was the first to report Harry was dating Meghan. Yeah, Kensington Palace put it this way, that they are put on this earth and they are paid to make sure that people like me don't get negative stories about the royals. So, but we've all got a job to do. With the wedding will come plenty of new pictures, a new chapter in Harry's story. In a way, it will be the culmination of his uneasy connection with the press. Thomas Dagg with CBC News, London. Now, Harry isn't the first to share his frustrations about the merciless gaze of the media, especially before a royal wedding. Like father, like son. Back in 1981, bride-to-be Diana fled from a polo match after a sustained siege of paparazzi. Prince Charles came to her defense. It's not much fun, actually, watching polo when you're being surrounded by people with very long lenses, poking them from all directions at you the entire time. And so I would only hope that after we get married, it'll be a bit easier. As you heard in Thomas's story, that hope was in vain. Fast forward to 2005, soon before his marriage to Camilla Parker Bowles, and Charles was posing with his sons for an annual photo op at a Swiss ski resort. BBC's royal correspondent asked about the upcoming wedding. Huh? Prince Charles, how are you feeling? Well, it's a very nice thought, isn't it? I'm very glad you've heard of it anyway. 
Royals will manage the media their whole lives, smiling for cameras that will be there to capture their missteps. They all knew it then, and Harry knows it now. Meghan Markle presumably knows it now, too. When we come back, Adrian Arsenault delves into Markle's role with well-known royal biographer Andrew Morton. Is it in the shadow of Diana? Is it that it's the spark of Diana? How, how would you characterize her place in this? Her, her place is, is very much kind of the ghost of Diana, really, or the aura of Diana. You know, it's almost like the baton has been, as it were, psychically passed on. Hundred percent. I can't wait. I'm really excited. Well, I'll be watching it. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, I'm really happy. Yeah, really happy for them. I'm happy for them. Excited for them. But um, uh, I think the uh, monarchy is a bit of an anachronism. Some of the reactions in London this week to this week's royal wedding. We put cutouts of the royal pair in Piccadilly Circus, uh, and as a barometer of public interest, the result was sometimes a little weird. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> they might make great cutouts, they do, but how do Harry and Meghan fit into the larger royal picture? Arguably, no one has dug deeper into the details than royal biographer Andrew Morton. He sat down with Adrian Arsenault and laid out what makes this royal couple so remarkable. This wedding will be a show only the royals can pull off. We know that but more lighthearted, a bit more open, certainly historic. Very excited. excited. Yes, I'm very happy for them. An heir to the British throne, marrying an American actor, divorced, raised Catholic, a woman of color, and an activist long before she met her prince. Is it true that Harry assembled some video clips from Suits to show the his grandparents? His grandparents? From what I gather, yeah. Any sense of, of how that went over? Well, I'm sure it wasn't the full Monty, was it? <laughs> it's quite a story for the royal biographer, Andrew Morton. He wrote Diana, her true story. Now he's written Meghan, a Hollywood princess. We met in New York to talk about Meghan Markle's moment. And this wedding, he says, that will lead to a certain royal ancestor spinning in his grave right below all the festivities. He'll definitely be spinning in his grave. Uh, the Duke of Windsor is buried in the grounds of Windsor Castle. And the reason why is he abdicated his throne in 1936 so that he could marry a twice-divorced American, Wallace Simpson. And now what's happening? A divorced American is walking down the aisle. She's going to be made Her Royal Highness. And so it shows you the transformation inside the royal family and also inside the nation with regards to divorce. Well, certainly within the Queen's own family, they are no stranger to divorces. Divorce has become actually a fact of life. Three of her four children have, have divorced. Um, her sister, Princess Margaret, divorced. And of course, famously, Prince Charles and Princess Diana divorced. Kind of set the tone for the, for the rest of the Queen's reign because both William and Harry have effectively been allowed to marry who they want. Was it a matter of Harry legitimately saying, this is, the, this is the love of my life, Nana, the Queen, <laughs> Your Majesty, this is the woman I would like to marry. Is, is there any protocol that says that the Queen has to decide if that's okay? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, 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 Harry's in the line of succession. He has to get permission from the Queen. And he took Meghan along to Buckingham Palace October last year to meet the Queen and let the Queen, that is grandmother, run the rule over her. But also the Queen was running the rule over Harry because, remember, ten years before, she could, she could be kind of scratching her head and saying, no, nah, not so much. I mean, because he was a wild child, he was a drunk, he was an angry young man. So you think if he'd actually met Meghan Markle a decade earlier and introduced her to the Queen, the Queen would have said no? Probably, because of Harry's behaviour. But, and that's what a, a former courtier at Buckingham Palace said to me. It, it's Hello Canada that did that video with Meghan Markle some time back asking her William or Harry. And she really didn't know. I have to say, Hello Canada loved the fact that they've got that video. Prince William or Prince Harry? I don't know. <laughs> Harry. <laughs> Harry? Sure. When you actually look at her on the screen, she's totally nonplussed. She's, you can see her, she's like a rabbit in the headlights thinking, who's William 
and who was Harry? And the, there was a real sense that she didn't even know who they were. At that time, though, Harry, as you say, was living a, a very different life, and, and so we've been, we've been talking about, as has everyone, you know, look, look at the picture of Diana and, and Meghan here. People have been talking about the, the presence of Diana, and I can't figure out the right terminology. Is it in the shadow of Diana? Is it that it's the spark of Diana? How, how would you characterize her place in this? Well, I mean, her, her place is, is very much kind of the ghost of Diana, really, or the aura of Diana. Diana died age 36, Megan's 36. Megan is a, an independent humanitarian, eloquent, articulate, makes speeches. Diana, at that time in her life, independent humanitarian. And, you know, it's almost like the baton has been, as it were, psychically passed on. What do you think your mother would have thought of Megan or said about Megan? At least they'd be thick as thieves. <laughs> <laughs> Without question, I think she would be over the moon, you know, with, with the ring and with everything else that's going on. I'm sure she's... Uh, she's with us. I'm sure she's with us, yeah, you know, jumping up and down somewhere else. You know, Harry said in that interview that, that Meghan and his mother, he thought, would have, would have been as thick as thieves. Do you actually think so? I mean, you, you knew Diana. She would have loved the fact that he has a spring in his, his step. And, He's whistling a merry tune. Um, he's a, he's a, a man reborn, and the fact that that uh, Megan's making him happy is what most parents want for their children. The fact that Megan's bringing a degree of experience of the world, not just of the movie world, but also of uh, the world of philanthropy, charities, United Nations, uh, adds an extra dimension to her involvement with the royal family, and that again would have. Uh, uh, impressed the princess, the late princess. And so when you went to Pasadena to spend some time there learning about Meghan Markle, you, you probably had a sense of her activism already, but what surprised you about what you learned about the degree she was interested in that? Well, I, quite frankly, I was very surprised, the fact that she was so young. I mean, you know, the fact that she was debating and discussing issues like the first Gulf War, age 10, and that she was leading a demonstration, making placards, it was interesting. What's the dishwashing liquid story? Age 10, she's organising demonstrations. Age 11, she's, she's notorious in school for writing letters to food corporations complaining about sexist advertising on a Procter & Gamble um, campaign for, for dishwashing liquid. Women are fighting greasy pots and pans. And she thought that was wrong. She thought that it should be people and her dad said, well, write, write to them. So she wrote to Procter & Gamble. And all that to be said, um, within a month, that advertising campaign was changed from women to people. The gloves are coming off. People are fighting greasy pots and pans with ivory clear. Meghan Markle. And it's something she used when she, a few years later, made a speech at the United Nations. In doing this, we remind women that their involvement matters. So she's always had that activist side to her. And if she hadn't been um, an actress, uh, she would, could well have been a politician. She could well have been a diplomat. Well, she uh, tried, right? She wrote the Foreign Service exam. Yeah, and failed it. If she'd have passed it, we could be talking about Amb Ambassador Markle today, not Princess um, Meghan. You know, we seem to have claimed Meghan Markle even though she is an American. Uh, well, she's an honorary Canadian. I think so. I think she's the, an honorary Canadian princess, don't we think? I, well, she's I think, now. I think we'll confer her with that title. Okay. Because it's more than, than Toronto being a place to lay her head while she was shooting suits. There's, there's more to the Canadian connection, right? Yeah, and she actually talked about going to live there, if you recall, when uh, candidate Trump um, uh, was looked to be on the verge of winning the election. So she does obviously have an affection for it as a place of civilization and refuge. Did it mean something for Harry as well? We look at some of these pictures of him as a little kid playing with Diana and William. I mean, is, does Canada mean a, a bit of anonymity for him, a, a bit of freedom? Canada has always had a special place for most members of the royal family. And it's interesting how many royal princes have fallen for Canadian girls over the years. So it must be something in the water. The fact that Meghan lived in Toronto helped to grow the relationship enormously. There's no paparazzi culture in Toronto. Unlike New York, London and Paris, they were able to 
walk the dogs, go out and about. So in a way, Toronto is the perfect ground, it's very f fertile ground for a royal romance to develop. You know, when we talk about, about Harry, as you were watching him grow up, at what point did your heart start beating a little harder out of worry for him? Well, the, the, the time after the funeral, where it seemed to be a very lost young man, and there are some pretty telling pictures of him emerging from Bougie's nightclub, since closed down, uh, very worse for wear, and tr trying to start fistfights with uh, paparazzi photographers. Well, that was somebody who was um, very much out of control. What saved him? Well, he says himself, uh, uh, that coming back from Afghanistan 2008 with uh, three British soldiers badly injured uh, and a Danish soldier in a, in a, in a, in a coffin uh, was something that really gave him pause to think about his future, his future responsibilities and it, it was the germ of the idea for the Invictus Games which as we know were held in Toronto. <laughs> So not to put too much, too fine a point on it, but there is a lot riding on, on this union. Absolutely. Her very existence as a biracial member of the royal family, the first biracial member of the royal family, um, will make people look again at the uh, composition of the royal household. There's only something like 6% of ethnic minorities in the 1,100 people who are employed by the palace. And I've always argued that the whole, th the point about having a monarchy is it, it, it represents the nation. And it's, it's a very skewed sample of the, of the British demographic. You just hope that in time, the slow gearing of the palace changes uh, the composition. Is there something in the wedding itself that, that you're going to be watching for in particular? For me, the enduring moment is going to be the Queen and her interaction with Doria Ragland the longest serving monarch in British history, next, standing next to the what, great, great uh, granddaughter of a slave. And from a family where at one point, a member of that family worked um, as a maid at Windsor Castle. This is kind of a, a true Cinderella story. Interesting. Andrew, thank you very much. You're a good sport. My pleasure. <laughs> So with wedding preps underway, we are obviously getting ready too. CBC News will bring you special coverage of the royal wedding on television, on radio and online all this week. We'll bring you the national from London and Windsor and dig into questions about the couple, the monarchy, what this union represents. And then join Adrian bright and early next Saturday. She may or may not wear a fascinator. Live coverage of the big event. You can wear PJs. We'll give you a front row seat to the wedding of the year beginning at 4 a.m. Eastern on CBC Television, CBC News Web Network, cbcnews.ca. Hope you can make it. living my religion. It is a part of my faith. Some of the stories we're following this week on The National. On Tuesday, convicted polygamists Winston Blackmore and James Oler will face a sentencing hearing. Blackmore and Oler were religious leaders in Bountiful, B.C. Earlier this year, they failed to have their convictions thrown out after arguing Canada's polygamy laws are unconstitutional. They now face a five-year prison term. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is set to receive an honorary doctorate of laws from New York University and deliver a commencement speech in Yankee Stadium. NYU says it's recognizing Trudeau for his work creating new jobs, fighting climate change, and achieving reconciliation with Indigenous people. First, he takes a shot deflected score! The Winnipeg Jets continue their run to the cup last night. They took the opener of the Western final against the Vegas Golden Knights. Score was 4-2. to Game two is tomorrow night in my hometown of Winnipeg. The Jets are just someone touch wood. Seven wins away from hoisting the Stanley Cup. Go Jets, go. 
Today is the day that we honor mom. But for those affected by last month's tragic Humboldt Broncos bus crash, Mother's Day would have been very difficult. Something not lost on some other hockey moms from around the world. And their generosity of spirit is our moment of the day. This initiative was started by hockey moms wanting to do something special for the hockey moms of Humboldt who have suffered the most tragic loss. With Mother's Day being a mere five weeks from the time that this accident happened on April 6th, the hockey moms that I've talked to all felt like they wanted to do something for these moms. So we came up with the idea to send flowers to all of the biological moms, billet moms, and other moms in the community that have helped these families get through this tragic time. We sent out 55 bouquets of flowers, which was amazing. We wanted them to just feel our love and let them know that the world is stopping and thinking about them on this day and hoping that there's Mother's Day will be a little less sad, uh, that these flowers might bring a little bit of peace or sunshine into their life in a weekend that we know will be a very difficult weekend for them to get through. So from hockey moms around the world, we want to give you a gigantic hug and say to you, Happy Mother's Day. And Happy Mother's Day to all of you. Your moms, if you're a mom, you play the role of a mom, all the different variations that it comes in. Hope you had a good day. That's The National for May 13th. Good night, everybody. See you back here tomorrow.